Kristen. So welcome everybody to this week's collective learning meeting. Please remember to mute your mics unless you want to ask a question. Please feel free to use the chat box. If you type a question there, I, Christine Tang, can ask the question for you. Today's date is Friday, March 13th, and our reporter today is Timothy Clancy, who will be presenting on his uh, tracking of the coronavirus. Take it away. Well, thanks, Christine. Welcome, everyone. And full disclosure up front, this is going to be an unusual CLM because it's not really about system dynamics as much as it is about communicating with the public and having a discussion which I actually think is really important for system scientists and system dynamicists to get better at. And so it's going to be a little free form, but what I wanted to do today is kind of show what I did, sort of how I got into this, what I've been doing, some of the things that have happened from this discussion as the COVID tracking has gone on, but also make it Q and A about, and maybe people can share examples as well of how they use social media and things like that to communicate. So I think to start with what I'd like to do is, um, kind of do a brief background of, of what's going on and how I got into this, because it was somewhat by accident. Um, I actually run a blog called The Info Mullet, and I'm sharing it on the screen here. It's The Info Mullet, and it's, a, it's called The Info Mullet because I'm famous for having very long posts, so everyone would say you need to put a TLDR, like too long didn't read. And so The Info Mullet is this, there's this hairstyle called the mullet, and it's the, the joke with the mullet is it's business up front, party in the back, and the info mullet is a blog where I put the TLDR up front, the short little blurb of what they need to know. And then I have pages and pages and pages of text that is more information. And I use this to track. I've done it for years. I've been doing this off and on for 20 years now. You can see here in the calendar, these are only some of the posts we have, but it goes back all the way to 2002. So what happened was in January, because I, I cover everything, I started tracking the coronavirus in late January. So you can see here, this is January 26th. And what was interesting here, I wanted to cover this from a system perspective. You know, we knew this was a novel virus. We knew this was going to be interesting. And, and the media was kind of covering more of the shutdown and the, um, the quarantine that was going on. And what we did is we tried to, um, I, you can see here, there's a model structure. I actually linked and began describing using system dynamics, the SIR model, which anyone who's done you know, WPI work, the susceptible infected and um, recovering, it's a very common epidemiologic uh, infectious model. And I made a link to IC systems. So part of this is, and I think the link is at the bottom here. Yeah, so I, part of what I wanted to show now, as I go to this new screen, hopefully you're tracking as I move the screen, correct? Christine is, is showing up the new screen. Mm -hmm. Good. So part of this was to give them information. So very early on in, in January, we're giving them um, the system structure and linking to an IC systems. IC systems is fantastic in this way. They've got so much material that you can go on there. And I started poking around and I found this great interactive model that's flu season in the classroom. It's, I mean, it's a basic SIR model. And so I was linking this to people to say, if you want to understand the basic structure of a virus, go here and you can see that it's a great use of IC system storytelling capability because you can advance by page and it shows you, you can play with the model, but they also give you a chance to go in deep to the model and learn. So we gave this tool before coronavirus. I mean, it was obviously concerning at China, but it hadn't really broken out yet in China. And we gave this tool to say, hey, you may want to learn about this, but while you're here, learn the system structure that we system scientists use and then we also gave them some, you know, the, the standard charts of like, hey, this is what's happening in the breakout. I described doubling rates. I described a doubling period and what that meant for exponential growth, because that's something a lot of people don't understand. Um, you know, we described some of the problems and then we gave them links to trackers. So this was in January 26. And this was very early on in terms of the overall cycle. The second post I made was by, this is now March 2nd. So we've gone from January 26 all the way through February to March 2nd. And now it's a much bigger issue because China has literally shut down Hubei province. Um, it's, it's had multiple outbreaks. There's now 60,000 people infected at this point, at least in China. And what we noticed was there was a, a, a concern that was bordering on panic. And the problem was the panic wasn't to do something like social distancing or wash your hands. The concerns early on in the US in March 2nd was that this was gonna kill millions 
And so everyone was running out and doing the things you don't want them to do. They were buying um, masks and gowns and all sorts of things that you needed for the healthcare workers. So this article was actually began a little bit more of a mix between education and advocacy. And what it was is again, TLDR up front, I did a little blurb. Um, I put a caveat here uh, because I wanted to be clear. I do, and this does get out to a lot of system scientists, this, but blogs are not peer reviewed article. It's a blog written for a hairstyle. So the, the caveat is kind of a disclosure that says what I'm putting here is notional but we went back and we reviewed the information that was starting to come out. Things like r, r naughts, which is the replication factor of a virus. We began reviewing it. We showed the shape. You, you've probably seen this shape all over by now. Um, and Christine, let me know. I'm seeing chats come up. If there's questions, feel free to stop me and, and put up because this is very free form. But you, you've seen this shape by now, which is the, the large outbreak with the high spike versus the flatter outbreak with, and the, the, the mental model, what we're trying to do is get people to understand the mental model is that what you want is you don't want this really extreme outbreak up and down. You want a flatter one because that's easier on the healthcare system and it, it causes less resources. This is now all over social media, not my specific graph here. This actually comes from the Canadian Broadcasting Service, but this concept of flatten the curve, we were trying to educate them early on in, uh, sort of early March about this, but we're also trying to show that, show that these infections don't necessarily go to the entire population. The SIR model, the SIR model, it burns itself out. And we were already seeing in Hubei that it would burn itself out at a level of population that was less than the entire United States. So the, the threat was not everyone's gonna get sick and then 4% of the people will die. The threat is a lot of people are gonna get sick in a very short time and that's gonna overwhelm the health system. And therefore we need to do these things. and. I brought in some techniques in this case that aren't really system dynamics techniques, but they were um, things I've done in the past for analysts for the military. In the military, you're often to do analysis that's in cases of ambiguity. So in this case, I did um, some back, well, we established kind of some, some thresholds here. So we showed that there's a, the growth and collapse on the left is the hypothetical growth and collapse of a sharp outbreak. Then we showed that in Hubei, in the middle of this picture, this was the actual Hubei data, and it fits that curve. It shows the bell curve of the rise. And then we plotted the cases, or this is actually someone else's graph. You'll see where I plotted it. And you see the S curve. So we were trying to educate people on, they were gonna hear these things about um, new cases per day and total cases, but start looking for these patterns to educate themselves on these behavior patterns because it was gonna start happening all over. We, we, then talked about how you can take a um, the number of cumulative cases at the end of the S curve after it's stabilized and use that as a percentage of population and then begin answering these questions. Because at this point, this is early March, the big question is, is China's data even accurate? And everyone's running around having that discussion but not doing anything with it. So what we did is we showed how you can use ambiguity to create a range of forecasts which give you now a sense of potential activities based off the level of error that we think might be coming out. And so the baseline forecast here is literally we took the Hubei data, we applied the same, and you can see here on the left is the region, the population, the infectivity rate is the cumulative cases divided into the total population at the end of the S curve. So it's not an R naught rate anymore because R naught gets dynamic over time. Then we broke it out using the WHO data, how many were mild, severe, critical, and the fatality rate. And this is where you start to get in. So this is the baseline. We just took China as it was and applied it to the US. And you can begin to see that mild cases by definition, very, very mild. They could, they could also be, you know, you feel it. You feel like you're getting hit by a truck, but it's not requiring hospitalization. But severe cases and critical cases, the severe cases, you have to go to the hospital, get some treat, you know, you know, get checked out. And it's critical cases, you, you are literally hospitalized. So this is the number we started telling people would be the problem if this number all happens at the same time. You know, everyone's saying it's the same as the flu season. Well, our healthcare infrastructure is designed for one flu season, not one flu season plus another flu season on top of it. And you could look here and say, okay, if this, if China is right with its data, then this is what we think would happen in the US. But then we started doing the ambiguity scenarios. What if China's underreporting their infections by a factor of 10? And these are very simple, these are not sophisticated calculations. This is basically saying, all right, China had reported 65,000 infections. What if they're reporting there's actually 650,000 infections? 
They've underreported by 10. We were showing, though, that if all that happens is China's underreporting it's infected by 10, that's bad because you have these red ones are actually are worse to baseline. The, the scale down here is green is better to baseline, orange is the same, and red is worse. But an interesting dynamic in, in infections is if the infected rate goes way up, but the deaths stay the same, then the fatality rate drops. So you see here the fatality rate under the scenario that China is underreported. And when you do these sort of ambiguity analysis, you have to distinguish between things which are easy to underreport and things that are harder. It's a lot harder to get an inaccurate reporting on infections because there could be mild cases or they don't have enough test kits. Deaths are a little bit harder to obscure. I mean, it's not impossible. You, we're going to talk about that in a bit. But deaths are much more objective thing to track. So the first scenario is if they underreported their infections, but the fatality or the death stayed the same, it actually ends up being a big health crisis, but the fatality rate is actually lower than we fear. Then we said, okay, what if they're underreporting both? What if both infections and death are being underreported? And when I say underreporting, it could be that China was suppressing the information or it could be they lost track of it. As the, we move around in more and more countries here, there's a lot of reasons why there might be underreporting. In the US, I use the phrase underreporting because we don't have enough testing kits. But you start dealing with these orders of magnitude and error and saying this one is 10 times off. So what happens if, and now you begin to see, well, if China was 10 times off the infections and 10 times off the fatality rate, they had 26,000. That means that 135,000 people will die in the US. And that's a very serious you know, the average flu season is maybe 20 to 30,000. The worst one in recent memory is maybe 80,000. So now you have a case where it's, and, and that makes sense, it's 10 times the amount that um, we anticipated it to be. Are there any questions in the chat? I'm seeing the chat go by, Christine. Are there any questions in there? Uh, there was a comment before about zooming in when there's a model or there's these tables. It might be easier for the audience to oh. see. And I said that Tom Finneman, built an SEIRD model, susceptible exposed yep. infectious recovered dead, using Bensim. And Kareem said their IC Systems is publishing a new and very different model this afternoon on the Ooh. exchange. If, if I can get that link, Kareem, I've got another article coming out this week and I can share it. I'd like, I'd like to sh share that if possible. So if you have something to um, do, please, yeah. please let me know. I'll forward it to you. Great. So <clears throat> then... Then we, so the, the first ambiguity was underreporting of infections. The second ambiguity was underreporting of infections and deaths. The third ambiguity is underreporting of deaths, but accurate reporting of infections. And this is a scenario where they got the infections right, but for some reason they were afraid they didn't want the news to get out or something happened and they were underreporting the deaths. And this is, again, you can see that much of it is the same as baseline, but of course, deaths are much worse. Um, then we did a, a locality ambiguity. You know, we weren't really sure at the time whether the cases were all clustered in the city of Wuhan, which is 11 million, or across the province of Hubei, which is 65 million. And of course, that makes a difference because we're using Hubei's population numbers. So we did, you know, when you're doing these ambiguity estimates, you just take a reasonable thing and say, what if 80% of the cases were in Wuhan? And so now we drop our population number. It changes all the factors because you know, it's now more concentrated and we project that on the US and we see that it's still bad, but it's less worse than the most worse. And so what you see here is you begin to do, and you can do these ambiguity things as much as you have time. I mean, I did five of them, but you begin to get worst case scenarios that it doesn't get much worse than the worst case. You get best case scenarios and you begin to see what falls in between. Um, these are all the scenarios put together. And then I added a fifth scenario, a final one. So this is showing in the US total infected um, and, and, and base case is what China's data was accurate. Case number one is there is an underreporting in China of infections. Case number two is underreporting of death and infections. Case number three is deaths are only underreported. Case number four is it's much more concentrated in the Wuhan than we thought. And then case five, when you're doing ambiguity forecasting, especially in something where you have multiple dimensions of ambiguity, we've only talked right now so far about data ambiguity, but it's a novel virus. We don't know how at this point, how it was spread. We didn't know what its factors were, how long it had its half-life. All of these things add extra ambiguity. So we took a worst case scenario 
multiply that by two to three. So now we have a 20 to 30 fold error factor and said, this is what happens if this is like saying that what what happened in China is 30 times off what we should expect to happen in the US. And it gives us an outer range of, I mean, it's a really serious one, but it also shows us that it's not the entire country. People were thinking about millions of people dying and that was causing them to panic and go out and buy masks and gowns that healthcare workers needed. So part of this is to say, even under the worst case scenarios, it's not gonna be that bad. And we'll get into what we did recommend to do. And then we, the final thing in ambiguity analysis, and this is a little trick we used in the military was, what we called orders of magnitude difference, right? We compared the order of magnitude and the error with the relative magnitude of the change of the impact. <clears throat> and what it was is the baseline shows that <clears throat> at if, if what happened in China happened here and the same parameters held, there was no error and it was, you know, ended at the same time, it would be about one sixth the worst recent flu. But if China was 10 times off, it would be one and a half times worse here. And if China was 20 to 30 times off, it would be three to five times worse here than, than this recent flu. And what this gives you now is this, this, this understanding that the order of error is increasing by a large amount and the order of impact is not increasing by the same scale. So it's one of those things that you could say, even if we're a hundred times off, it may be six times worse or eight times worse or 10 times worse, but it's not gonna be a hundred times worse. And so you see that these order of magnitudes begin diverging. And again, this is very simple math done at a point in time, but it's to calculate when you need to get out information, you often can't wait for peer reviewed scientific research. I mean, this was published or written, it got published the day after the WHO did its first report on China, where they actually was able to go through in and get a really good data. So this doesn't reflect any of that WHO report that came out the Monday um, in early March, but it was the day after. And then we went through, and sometimes when you're talking to the public, it's not just about the numbers, we went through the cognitive triggers and biases that are going out. Why were people panicking to buy gowns and masks? Crowding out effect, and we went through here these, I don't know if, if people care about these, but we're going through the mental things that when you're dealing with risk, humans have certain heuristic effects with how they evaluate risk and deal with risk that causes them to overcalculate some risks and undercalculate. Um, with others. So we went through what these are so people could recognize them. And our the entire theme of this article is a panic is when you have a, a voice in your head that's shouting really loud to do something, but it doesn't know what the right thing to do is. And the rational voice is saying, practice social distancing, practice good hygiene, stop touching your face. But it's getting shouted over by something that says, that's not enough. We have to do something. We have to go buy toilet paper or um, you know masks. And you want to shift the mental model from the shouting voice reduce the volume and give the rational voice a little bit of time to be heard so that you change the behavior to something that is more uh, beneficial or sort of public good. And that's sort of how we explain at the end here and basically tell them, you know, we give them, when you're doing this, a lot of the media that I don't, that I've been frustrated with is the reporting on this was, here's something to really, really scare you and, and, and nothing you can do tangibly that will cause a change. Now, there's, there's a valid case that advocacy is important. There's a valid case that activism is important, holding governments accountable. But human behavior is if you get scared and don't feel you have any control, that voice that's shouting in your head is going to have you pick something. So whenever doing these communications, you wanna have something very simple that they can do, not just as a general thing, but we said here at the end of this article, right now, as you're sitting in your chair reading this or on the phone, when was the last time you practiced not touching your face for an hour? Now, this is in early March. And my guess is people were starting to talk about it, but very few people had sat down and started actually practicing not touching their face because it's incredibly difficult. And um, so we gave them something. And this was, you know, this is 4,500 words. It's got a whole bunch of sources. It's kind of a, a little mini paper. And we weren't expecting it. You know, this is the kind of context we give the readers. Normally, we track non-state actor stuff. And what happened is, um, I can share the dashboard here. I'm gonna open this up. I'll, I'll zoom in the screen here. I, uh, this is my blog behind the scenes. So now we've gone from the post that was made public to what happened behind the scenes. And I don't know if this is big enough to see. Um, let me get the camera out of the way. Can you see here this one here? This article since March 2nd has been read 16,000 times. <laughs> that was more 
then all, you know, most of our other ones, you can scroll through here. It's, it's 450, 120, you know, these are normal blog numbers, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm sure those of you who run blogs sort of know, we got 16,000 hits in one, um, little more than a week and a bit here. It was, I guess it came out the second. So it's now been 11 days. And this is, this is what it looks like on Facebook side. And you can see here, um, get to, here we go. This is what it looks like on our Facebook for the blog post where we run and you can see the reach and the actions you get. Um, here we go. This is where we put the mental model. So March 3rd, it got viewed 4.4 thousand times and read a thousand times on Facebook. It got read 16,000 times on the blog itself. So this thing went shared every, well, I mean, it didn't get shared everywhere. There's, it's not much from a viral standpoint, but it really, it crashed our website. It, it really <laughs> it made a, a big difficulty, but we realized there was a desire for this kind of deeper context news. And so the final article we did, and then I'm gonna pause for questions, is we began tracking these behavior modes. So we took the WHO data, which is coming out daily. Every day the WHO is reporting confirmed cases, fatalities, and it's by country. And we began plotting them in these charts. And what we did is we first, we tried to explain the charts and showed what the chart looks like. I don't know if this is, <coughs> We did the same two charts that we showed them before that was hypothetical. This is the rise and the collapse of the, the change in daily rates, and this is the um, cumulative. And what we did is we, we organized this to make it easy to compare countries because the data was coming out without any means to understand context of Italy versus China or what's going on in the US. And so what we did is we plotted a logarithmic scale in population so we could have it all in one chart. So the, the key thing is we reminded folks, base 10 here, if it's halfway up the chart, that doesn't mean it's halfway to 100,000. It means it's only at 1,000. Then we aligned all the breakouts by days since first patient. So this is literally a life cycle chart. You're seeing here from when China's first patient to, to I think it's day 70 now. Likewise, you're seeing every country is adjusted to start when they're first patient. So you can kind of get a feel for relative comparison of growth. And then this blue band is a risk threshold that was identified by the University of Washington based on that WHO report that came out of China that says, as you go through this risk threshold, your chance of an outbreak increases. And what we were trying to educate them is not, we weren't doing um, sophisticated training. We were like, look at the steepness of the curve that passes through the risk threshold. When you talk about exponential growth, the steeper this curve is, remember, we're talking to a lay audience here. These aren't system dynamicists, but we're saying, look at the steepness of the line as it passes through the risk. Th the steeper that line is, the, the more likely you are to hit an outbreak or the more, you know, if it doesn't hit the band at all, you're, you're doing good. And then we said the reason why that steepness matters is the actual change over the daily rate of change. Um, and so here China is presented as the daily rate of change of new cases. So 10% means 10% more cases from the day before. And you can see here China had this daily rate of change. Well, as us system dynamicists, we know this is the stock and this is the flow or a measure of the flow in this case. And so what we did was we presenting a stock and flow data to say the stock tells you where you're at, but it's the change that really tells you where you're going. And then we began plotting these for different regions. And I'll skip, I'll, I'll, uh, let's see here, Southern Europe. This has been the one that's been in the news. When we plotted this, Italy was just breaking in the news, but you can see um, I've got Italy, France, Spain, and Switzerland here. You can see the steepness of the line as Italy passes through that risk threshold is almost the same as China was, and it's still a steep pattern. So this is a, a key indicator that the outbreak was happening in Italy even before it became you know, global news. I mean, think, I think the people in Italy realized it. Um, and you can see it's a kind of a choppy change over time. Some of these graphs aren't pretty, but we're also showing that it doesn't need to be this way. Um, let's see here, East Asia, here we go. This compares China, Japan, and South Korea. And you can use these charts to say, hey, government, South Korea had a breakout. They're the yellow line here. You can see them plotted to China. They had a breakout, but you can see that S curve already forming. They were already beginning to contain it at under 10,000. And what we were using this was to show is a really nice example of a declining change over time in the yellow here. So you can see China plotted here. This is the China outbreak. Korea spiked. You know, at one point they had 100% more cases than they did the day before. Some of this is because of testing. If you start testing more, you're going to find more. But you can see that change over behind or change over time begins declining 
and it lines up. You can you you see where as it begins to the the, the change over time declines. You can see that's having an impact on the softening of the growth curve. Um, and so we're we're actually going to update these. These were last updated on the ninth. Uh, we have the Middle East, the Gulf uh, Gulf Cooperation Council. I combined all the 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 uh, countries in the Gulf, Iraq and Iran, and all of a sudden, interesting things start to pop out when you do this. Here's Iran. Actually, when you align it for days of first confirmed patient, way worse than China. And that tells me that the argument that they were suppressing information probably has some validity to it because every other case we've seen um, in Iraq too kind of jumped up, but it's, it's leveled out a little bit. Every other case we've seen, it's been a gradual growth, but Iran just starts almost going vertical. And this tells you it doesn't say for sure that they're suppressing information, but it makes a good argument that their behavior mode is literally a straight line up as opposed to an S curve. Um, and so, and then again, some cases, South America, there's been almost no cases so far. I mean, there's a handful here and there. I think Brazil is up to a, couple, uh, a handful, maybe 10 or 20. Um, South Asia, everyone was watching. I worked with activists who are in Bangladesh. The Bangladesh activists got a hold of this information. So when you go viral, you start getting all these sort of contacts around the blue. And one of them was a Bangladeshi act activist group. They were wondering where all their cases are. This is South Asia. This is India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Singapore. Uh, Singapore is not really in South Asia, but I wanted to include it for comparison. Um, the reason this is a concern is between India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, you're talking about 1.82 billion people between these three countries. And they're not, you know, the infrastructure isn't necessarily great. There's huge crowding conditions. There's a lot of people. And the question is, this could be a real nightmare scenario, and yet virtually no cases. And everyone's asking, why? Why is it that India and um, Pakistan have virtually no cases, whereas Bang in Bangladesh has none when this was done. They now have a couple. Um, and the first, my first thought was the government's not reporting it, but people working with the local doctors, the doctors are aware of it. They're looking out for it and they're not seeing it. So there's a real question of, is this just hidden data that's going to come up in a big thing? Is it's not being reported? Is there some other environmental factor? We don't know because the WHO data is the WHO data. That we, we put caveats in this that we can only report what the WHO reports. So if they're not getting it from the government or people aren't getting tested, or even if there's fatalities but they're attributed to some other cause, it doesn't show up here. So this has been the coverage that we've done so far. Three articles, um, Facebook posts with updates throughout. And I think another thing, we did a Facebook Live. Um, if I stop this share... One last share here to, okay, that's the info mullet. Twitter, you can see how bad I am at Twitter. I've only got 39 followers. I think Rafat gets that a day. But anyways, we did a Facebook Live, which was an Ask Me Anything. These sort of written material is, is kind of not as well consumed. So we actually created, um, we went on Facebook and I just did a live session where we had people, they would log into Facebook having read the articles and this is me just talking and answering questions based on the resource and answering their questions. And we put this on YouTube. It's gotten a cup, probably about 800 views on Facebook and on YouTube, it's up to 51 views. I just added it last night. So you talk about, this is where I wanna pause because this is the coverage. And now we start to talk about how you reach an audience. Um, my peer reviewed articles, I'm probably lucky if 100 people have read them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you think about it, but this blog post and these posts between them have gotten, we estimate somewhere between 25 and 30,000 reads, not just impressions. The impressions are off the chart, like people just seeing them, but the actual reads. So I think part of what I wanted to have today for as a discussion is as system dynamicists, we have something to say in these situations, the system structure, the concept of doubling behavior, uh, doubling exponential growth, uh, stock and flow, you know, measures between change and time. All of these things have value in these situations and how do we get better at getting our voice out there in a way that makes sense? I knew this article was not gonna be an easy read. It's for, you know, these were long articles with lots of charts and lots of data, but my hope was to reach people who would then reach other people. And I think that succeeded in some ways. So I wanna pause here and see if there are any questions or comments before we get into more open dialogue on, and then I wanna hear from Kareem and Rafa and some of these other people of their ideas of how we can get better as a community communicating to the general audience. So I'll pause here. So as the question was before, I think it was when uh, you were showing your first blog post, mm -hmm. why you didn't, or how about looking at South Korea, which seems to have more testing and data, which you looked 
at in your second blog post. Yep. So here, yeah, we, 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 these were done, you know, one of the things when you're doing a blog and I'm, I'm sure, you know, Kareem can appreciate running a business and trying to do media, you've got finite time. And at the same time, this is happening. Our, my consulting business is getting blown out of the water. So this, this, this COVID-19 has in the background of doing these blog articles, I'm getting canceled phone calls our pipeline shrinking up. Everyone's going into panic mode. So it's sort of like you balance what you have time. And I think the big thing is you probably don't want to communicate everything you can in one shot because it will take too long and you won't know what people actually are going to be interested in. I would recommend incremental approaches and then listening. One of the great things on social media is we would get Facebook posts that would ask a bunch of questions. We now have a frequently asked questions, including did China's authoritarian response work better than South Korea's? And that's a good question. I don't see the media discussing that question very well. Um, Things like, did, did were there underlying conditions of environmental conditions that made it worse in China than here? Why are there not enough testing kits in the US? Some of these you see reported in the media, but by getting this feedback and this interaction, you can kind of go to where the audience is looking for information. And while you're there, introduce them to the parts that are important. So that was a good question. And there were some statistics, Kareem said, South Korea has a death rate, or you use the word fatality rate, I believe, right, and of 0.6%, then? Yeah, so I'm actually going to, I'm charting that right now. We took the WHO data. At first, we did the WHO data for the confirmed cases and the rate of change. I actually, this morning, just finished doing up through last night the death rates and was going to plot a dynamic chart that showed over time, once they got to 20 fatalities, because, you know, Data can get really choppy at small numbers. So once a country gets to 20 fatalities or 20 deaths, what is its dynamic death rate over time as it adjusts? And put that up as a chart so you can begin to compare. Because I think that's a good point. The death rate is much lower in some of these countries. And that could be because China's infrastructure wasn't as well. Or it could be that China has chronic pollution. You know, they, And these are symptoms or, 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 or exacerbating factors where... Um, things like pollution or the frailty of the person. And, you know, maybe there's stuff in China that means that the death rate will be higher or lower. We'll get that when we do the update tonight or tomorrow is the sort of the dynamic over time chart. Other questions on this, on this part? No, most were just statistics about different types of death and uh, recommendations of things to read and, uh, listen to. Yeah. And there's a lot of good information flowing around. So part of what we've done is pivot from here. We're going to instruct you about system structure because we think we got that part out and do the tracking, focus on that and, and not try and compete with, in, in some ways we were trying to get ahead of where the, and the media sort of lags behind on this. And that's really unfortunate because they probably should have been at this level of discussion two weeks ago, but it is what it is. So thank you, Tim, for doing this. Uh, and despite that the business is suffering, but that's a good, uh, hell of a good marketing campaign. I'll put the Patreon in the chat that I started this so I can have groceries. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Tim. So, but what have others been doing? I'm interested in hearing now, like Kareem, you mentioned uh, um, there. <laughs> I have to put my Patreon. That's as a blogger, you got to put your Patreon everywhere. So I've, I've shared my Patreon. But Kareem, what are you doing? So tell us about this model that you're working on. Well, the model's done. We're putting an interface on it. That's what's holding it up. <clears throat> is it of COVID-19 or is it generic? It's of COVID-19 directly, and it's not like a traditional SAR model. It's trying to compartmentalize things. How... How much of a lay audience would be able to get that? Is it designed for a lay audience that it could be shared and they get to interact with it? And so the interaction is for a lay audience. We're not planning to, you know, hit them over the head with the model or even do storytelling. Because one of the early feedbacks I got was people who went to that classroom study that was hosted on your site. They said they learned more about infections in 15 minutes on that model than they had, you know, in, a, you know, biology classes and things like that. So if you have that link when that gets done, I'd like to share it. And I think this ability, it gives people something to interact with as opposed to trying to manage all these numbers in their head. You know, we as scientists often do these numbers in our head, but I think for them, it's a lot of fun to play with. 
it, it also has a number of policy options that you can play with and see what Ooh, that's, that's good. Rafat, I was going to ask about your background. It looks like you're at NASA. <laughs> no, that's my part of social distancing. I moved to outer space. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's WPI. Oh, you've got a you've got a filter on there that adds stars wherever there's apparently a white space. <laughs> wait, wait, wait! They moved WPI to outer space. <laughs> Some would say it was already there. Some would say it was already there. Are any professors on this chat? <laughs> is, this a, is this being recorded? <laughs> yes, it is being recorded. And Professor Redzicki is here. And, uh, that was referring to a different department entirely, not the fine <laughs> folks at the oh. social science and policy studies. So there was a question. Uh, do, you, do you see it in the chat or should I read it? Um, I was not paying when I was presenting. I wasn't watching this chat. So if, is it? do I need to scroll up to find it? Or if you have it, just shout it out. OK. So. What do you mean when you say that the blue bar represents the risk zone? Ah, so let me, yeah, got it. This is something we were trying to give people a uh, sense of how do you know when what you're hearing is leading to an indication that an outbreak has happened or containment has happened. And we were trying to make it simple enough that they could visually cue in, like, what do you need to look for? So the blue bar itself comes from the research that the University of Washington did, where they reconstructed the outbreak in China using both confirmed cases and estimates of unconfirmed cases. They created a timeline and said, at this point, China lost, you know, not lost, well, yeah, I guess lost control is right. At this point, it became an outbreak that was going to exponentially grow until it hit the top of the, um, the burnout phase. And then we went and found that point in the calendar. They, they had a timeline. We saw the number of confirmed cases, and I think it was like 800. And then we expanded a range of uncertainty and said, this is a risk zone. And what we're really trying to do, you know, for scientists here, there is no cause. We're not, in, we're not implying that it's a specific steepness. But to the lay reader, it's like the steeper that line is, as it crosses the threshold, the more risk you are that you're in an outbreak scenario. And I think it's held true pretty well because if you look at these cases where um, right all of these ones that are in the news here are crossing that threshold at fairly steep lines Italy Iran um, Spain France France is beginning to, to, to smooth out a little bit you see that they're actually crossing and and then even ones like this is I caught Benelux the Belgium Netherlands Luxembourg I combined them and I caught this and I'm like I haven't heard anything about Benelux and it turns out that they had a policy in the Netherlands where if you didn't feel sick enough not to work, you should go to work. Fine being out in the street festivals is a really bad policy choice and it may have something to do with sort of the work ethic and the culture of, you know, just get through it, don't worry about it. And they are really hurt now because they've got a very small population and they are at, on pace with these other major European countries. Same thing with the Nordic um, countries. They're, they're having a hard, so it was trying to get them. There's not a scientific relationship of the level of steepness as it goes through this zone. It was to the lay leader says, pay attention to the steepness. And if you, we use Japan as an example um, or Singapore, here's Singapore, right? Singapore, the brown line never gets close to the band of risk and it's very flat. So this is gonna continue to incrementally grow. This shows containment. This shows a really good containment because it's contained it beneath the breakout. Whereas um, Japan, it's approaching the breakout, but it's on a very flat increase. And if you look at the daily rates of change behind that, you see that Japan's daily rate of change in blue, it never spikes up into the, the risk zone that China and South Korea had. So between these two charts, it's, it's really notional and illustrative, but you're giving people useful tools to say, um, how can I evaluate where it might be going with the emphasis on do these good things that you should practice now and get in the habit of rather than ignoring it, which is kind of what our message was. So has anyone else done, so Kareem's done a model. I've done this. Has anyone else done any social media, even sharing articles on COVID? What's, what are other people doing around this? <sighs> So I saw an article or a blog post by Tom Fiddeman that I said before. Yeah. Is anyone else sharing? May, may, Go ahead. May, may, I, may I share some, some thoughts yeah. on, on, on this contrast? 
it's, the, the subject is not COVID. Oh, my wife is following that, she's a mathematician. But I, I'm, I, my, my, what captures my uh, curiosity here is the contrast between two types of media. One is the, as, as Tim said before, uh, the peer-reviewed uh, articles. And on the other hand, we have um, the new kind of information which we ha in which we have more freedom. Perhaps we don't have much uh, verification. Or, I mean, the authors may have, but it's not peer-reviewed or it doesn't have to be reviewed by anyone. So uh, on one hand, we have more popularity. On the other hand, we don't have so much reliability, perhaps. Uh, but my, my, my idea about the, um, the contrast, we, we have a gap here. One is the elite and supposedly good quality stuff. And the other hand, we have the very popular and kind of iffy, sometimes dodgy information. And I, it doesn't satisfy me. <laughs> this, this, the whole, the, the gap doesn't satisfy me. Why not go to the middle? I mean, I mean, this is a vision, okay? So it's like, why do we have very good quality information shared widely? And that would be trustable. That would be, I mean, the, the quality that we know in the in the peer reviewed stuff, but more popular, yeah. more accessible. Can, can I, I offer a thought on that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's it's, just a thought. It's yeah. because no, it's a really good thought. And what has been a ton of learning for me in the last week is how little I know anything about social media as a skill. The skills mm -hmm. to reach that popularity and get that reach is a skill set just as much as what we've learned in science. And so I think. Mm -hmm. One, when you talk about finding that middle, there needs to be a conscious effort to either equip resources that can do this. Like if a university wants to have, I work on Facebook pages that have 60,000 people on them and they have social right. media, the Santa Fe Complexity Institute. The Santa Fe Complexity Institute has a dedicated social media manager that is curating this stuff, keeping things moving, and they've got a presence that is year round. So when this comes out, they can share high quality stuff from the Santa Fe Complexity Institute. Okay. But I think a lot of scientists don't know how do you make a Facebook page? How do you manage it? How do you keep your Twitter going? I don't, I barely know Twitter, <laughs> but you know, how do you do YouTube videos? How do you do a yeah. video chat? These are skills that the scientists either need to learn or partner with to get it popularized. Yeah. yeah. It's good news that at least somebody are doing this. Um, yeah. And of course we know from the inside, uh, um, <clears throat> guidelines that scientists are not incentivated for that and they're in fact incentivated for the other way which is the more elite stuff and okay there's complex finance well, interests around that so not not for the moment but uh, but at least some people are doing this so they have their good work and then they're they're uh, disseminating this in in popular and, media which and is, I think you could I think part of like part of what I do with violence and instability is I try and have a leg in both domains. I do my peer reviewed stuff for violence and instability, mm -hmm. but I use that to inform my more casual blogging about non state actor violence and tracking that and bring that perspective. But you still have to, it's shorter articles, it's, it's, it's short entries, but you can inform that with what you've learned. And I think part of those skill sets is establishing a voice. The hard part with social media, you have mm -hmm. to have a voice before you need to use it. So I'd been doing the info mullet now for a couple of years and building this presence. And then this one happened to go viral, no pun intended, right? But that right, is right. not, I wasn't able to just on Monday say, you know what, I'm going to do this and set it up. And you start from nothing. You will still be have five followers that aren't your friends by the time this is over. <laughs> and it does take a lot of work and maintenance to keep it up. That's right. It's, yeah. But it's interesting. It's worth it, perhaps. Okay. Rafa, I'd be interested, Rafat, in your perspective, because you're the, what, eight-time social media award winner for the conferences? Who, who is? Rafat. Who, who is? Rafat, okay. Yeah, well. that, that's only for a, for a short time. <laughs> but, but you're right. What you, what you said uh, just, uh, just right now about you've been uh, doing this for some time, so there is a constant rate of... Uh, adding to the media so that you established your presence it's not just uh, that you you thought about it today and you just did it uh, so and you started early so that's another thing that you're doing which is being current so you did not wait until until uh, uh, the uh, the topic became very popular everywhere so these are lessons i think uh, to contemplate is just to to be uh, to be around always and do something. Uh, it's not just uh, 
So if you think about the stock and flow, your rate, your inflow is, is, is constant. You, it was not like zero and you suddenly went into, into so, writing. And so what Rafat's talking here about inflow is, is content pieces. If you have a Facebook, a blog, and a Twitter, and a YouTube, all four of those have to be regularly fed. Like I call it feed the beast. You have to have an inflow of content that's every couple days something's going on. And the way I do it is I do three to four big blog articles a month on the website because those are time intensive. I do lots of little updates on Facebook where it's easy. And that's where I got a lot of my audience from is Facebook. And then YouTube, I just take the videos I do on Facebook and load them up to YouTube. So it's sort of like I double dip. I don't have to make special content for that. And Twitter, I really don't have a clue what I'm doing. I occasionally post pictures and, and tag stuff, but I've only started doing that. And you can tell my Twitter's only 28, so it's not, or 38 followers. But I think part of it is creating a strategy of where is it easiest for you to publish content and reach people. And these days, if you're not connected to some social media, you, you, your, your blog's not going to be found just on the internet. You have to introduce it through YouTube, TikTok. I mean, show me the system dynamicist using TikTok and that person should get an award because TikTok is off the charts. That is a something that is getting tons of views and people are using Twitch and TikTok and all these different social media platforms to have a discussion. My question is, where are the system dynamicists in getting out into this media and not being the sage on the stage? I think uh, Anastasios, you use the concept of the elite, you know, the peer review. John Sturman had a really good uh, analogy at one of the winter camps that we're going from the model of stage on the stage or sage on the stage, you know, the professor up the lectern, peer reviewed paper, everyone's wrapped attention because that's a professor. No one listens to that anymore in the mass market. What they want is the guide on the side. And the phrase, the guide on the side is someone who can suggest to them is sharing articles. And what I've found very helpful is you're going to have a team of people on your site who are your sharers. It's not going to be you. It's going to be people that follow you and regularly share your stuff. They're going to amplify your words. So you have to cultivate that audience. And a lot of it is personal relationships. I do a lot of time responding to people and doing things so that they feel that there's a relationship with this site. So they share the information. And I, you know, I, I have some rules for myself. I don't get into fights. You know, you know, there's a lot of ways to become popular on social media that are probably inappropriate if you want to have a credibility you know, if you want to be credible, but you have to find that balance between how is this engaging and entertaining and still informing. There is, I think I see a question. Do you see it, Christine? Yeah. I think that question is for Kareem. I see. Okay. You, you said, what, what did we encounter as we read about it? I, I, I posted the link for, a, for an article on Medium. Mm -hmm. This is one of the uh, most elaborate articles that I came across and one of the, of the figures you have on your blog uh, that the S curve, uh, the China and then the, uh, the jump uh, afterwards. Yep. And that also talks about f fatality rates, uh, something that you are you've been talking about uh, as well. I was actually, I would not say surprised, but the amount of, of, of also good writing about this topic was, was uh, I would say, I wouldn't say surprisingly, but to me it was uh, something new to read, to see some insightful uh, writing other than uh, what you did uh, and you've been following this for some time, uh, Tim. So that, I think this is good. Thank you. And that's what I have for today. So oh, go ahead, Kareem. Yeah, as far as policy, so we're just we're just trying out policies that people are trying, like blocking borders, uh, having people self quarantine or um, social distancing, things like that. The from all the research I've done, the the three models of response. There's the Chinese one, which is ignore it or suppress information, and then over use the heavy heavy hand for strict physical quarantine. Singapore and South Korea have a very interesting model, which I'm looking for a word, but it's almost like an inverse quarantine. What they do is they identify with, they flood with tests. So they have massive amounts of tests. They find every confirmed case and then they list that person's information in apps and, and media so that people can move around that location. If you think about a quarantine, like China would quarantine entire cities or blocks to keep people from moving out. The Singapore South Korea model is they'd use data tracking to self-inform people to avoid that building on the fifth floor halfway down the hall if someone who's infected. 
if I just don't go near the building, I'm okay. And they would make sure those people are supported with services, but the population would then move itself around and sort of create their own little mini quarantines, which is much more resource effective in that, you know, as soon as you put a steel barrier up and say, you can't go around this, someone's going to go around it, over it, through it, under it. That's hard to control. But if people are self-regulating, that's much less resource intensive. The challenge is the privacy laws in Europe and US, I would got to imagine would prohibit saying here, you know, here's an infected person in this location that 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 would be private data. So it'll be interesting to see how Europe and the and and, and other um, sort of Western countries balance this, which approach do you take the heavy handed Chinese one um, with the physical containment, the uh, very data intensive and heavy testing regime for South Korea and Singapore, which in some ways we've lost on the test because we've the tests were so delayed. Um, but what what does that mean for privacy or some middle ground? Like right now, I, I'm actually very hopeful that with all the shutdown of the events, we're creating, it's not a quarantine, but we're, we're reducing the, the possibility with the shutdown of the sports events, the festivals. And it's, it's causing a little bit of concern because it's very unusual, but it's creating a dramatic effect of sort of moving people away in mass quantities and mass concentrations. Whether it will be effective, I don't know. Um, we'll see. And what are you saying? Surrounding a large part of a town with the National Guard isn't effective? Absolutely not. I know. Completely. But if you want to run that test, I'll be happy to uh, look at the results and share them. <laughs> uh, do you try and split the population? So Suleiman asked this question. Do you try and split the population by age? So I have a little bit of personal perspective on this. My, my parents live in an elderly care home in Seattle that was at ground zero of this incident. They don't, Life Care Center was the one where the cluster happened. 70 staff and patients got infected. Uh, 15 people died from this one facility. But what's not reported is that facility is the convalescence and recovery um, nursing facility for all sorts of elderly homes in the area. So my parents' home, it's about five miles away called Emerald Heights. They had 500 residents, 300 staff, and they're going in and out of that facility constantly right up until it gets shut down. And so now they were all waiting on pins and needles to say, well, when's the next shoe going to drop? They now have their first confirmed case inside the residence area where my parents are. So of course, this is very personal to me. And what I can tell is the procedures that they're doing there in terms of splitting the population, um, it's an elderly home. So everyone who's there is elderly, unless they're staff, but they actually have stricter procedures on the entrance to the facility than they do at the border. They are using temperature, um, they're restricting the flow of people in and out, not to say you can't go, but timing it. So like my parents went on their grocery trip, they were allowed out in a window. They, they, they made sure that there weren't people crossing in the halls. There's a lot of effort to sort of separate people in the elderly facility so that they're not running in and they're not allowing visitors in. So in terms of a split, what they're doing a lot in Washington is they are now um, prohibiting visits from anybody outside into these elderly facilities. And there's been some other measures where I think the governor has now declared any gathering over 250 is prohibited. And that means churches, music festivals, concerts, everything's, everything's done um, for now. And it's, my parents said when they went out, it was kind of like a ghost town. There was no one on the street. I mean, the stores were still open, Costco was still running, but it was a very, very few people on the street, which if you think about, well, that's, a, that's it's like a quarantine without having to force. And I think the measures right now are important because if we can get ahead of this, or at least we're probably behind it so much. I don't know if we can, but at least taper it a little bit. We might not have to go to excessive levels that probably won't help anyway. Just being out about the model, our model didn't split it into age groups, but it did split it into uh, severity of case. Mm, the mild, uh, severe, critical. Yes. Oh, okay. Hmm. So where do airplanes fit into this i i think um well they were the main in, in your model in kareem's model or, or in the global situation both well kareem you want to go ahead they're they're not in our model the model is just yeah. community at this point we're not it, doing travel between communities or anything okay. in, we can have people come in from outside but there's no explicit modeling of transportation or anything from a, what I've read on the research and doing the tracking, the, the role of airplanes in this is basically the seeding of every contagion that happened outside of China. So the initial contagions for the most part, one of the reasons that who didn't declare a pandemic at first is they look for, you know, un, unexplainable spread across the globe. And most of the initial cases 
were travelers coming back from airplanes. They might have been residents that traveled to China or travelers from China coming in. Um, and the airplanes were the seating factors that then populated this. Uh, but then you would have community spread eventually in those areas. And that's when they declared it a pandemic is when you had community spread in multiple continents and multiple countries. It's no longer just relying on travels. But I think airplanes played a vital role in spreading this. But, you know, there's all, all sorts of travel. I don't, you know, because the symptoms are so mild and they last for a while, someone could theoretically be on a boat. And, you know, the cruise lines are a great example of this. There's several cruise line ships that, you know, over the course of the thing, uh, the virus broke out and not everyone's sick on there. But now where do you port it? Where do you dock it? How do you treat those people? Anywhere this travel is, is a potential means of um, contagion. Well, that's all I have. So thanks everyone for joining. Hopefully this was at least slightly interesting. It's a little unusual, but it's been a bit of an unusual past couple of weeks. Thank you. Tom. Very interesting, Tim. Thank you okay. for the, in, uh, the, the work and the insights. Really nice. Uh, we still have the situation to solve, right? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Everyone take um, care. What, and thanks for you as well. Yep. Okay. Stop there. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.